Hi, everyone. My name is Renee Richard. I am the founder and executive director of Cinnamon Girl Incorporated. Cinnamon Girl is a leadership development organization providing access, experiences, and a network of professionals who work directly with our girls, inspiring them to be the visionaries our world needs. Our organization serves over 100 girls every single year. And of those that we serve, many of them will be in uh, the Bay Area's book talks. We have an amazing talk cultivated and curated from our girls and the questions they have for these authors. I know this will be a conversation that you'll enjoy. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about Cinnamon Girl, please visit us on the web at cinnamongirl.org. And with that, I am delighted to bring you just a few of my beautiful girls. Welcome to the Bay Area Book Festival's virtual festival. I'm Chariot Waddell from Cinnamon Girl, and with me today is Jolie Wilson. We're so excited to be talking with Kwame Onwachi. Kwame Onwachi is a James Beard award-winning chef and author of a critically acclaimed memoir, Notes from a Young Black Chef, which is tr being turned into a film feature by A24. Kwame's resume is incomparable. He has been named one of Food and Wine's Best New Chefs, Esquire Magazine's 2019 Chef of the Year, and is a 30 Under 30 honoree by, by both Daggett and Forbes. He has been also featured on Times 100 Next List, which has been named the most important chef in America by the San Francisco Chronicle. Welcome, Kwame. Um, we're excited Thank to be speaking with you today. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, let's get into our first question. Okay. So our first question is, um, basically, so Maya Angelou has this quote where she says, um, there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. Um, I kind of wanted to know, like, what made you decide to become a writer so you can tell your story? Um, did it yeah. like, in a way release something inside you being able to reflect on your past or... Well, you know, I, I told my story a lot of when I was doing these pop-ups around the country. I, I would uh, take over these like, um, you know, these these spaces that were like either abandoned or, or unactivated, like a library, and we, I would turn them into a restaurant. And I would always tell the guests a portion of my story. Now that story would get a little bit longer if we needed more time in the kitchen to plate up <laughs> or it'd be a short okay. snapshot. And, and I got really, really comfortable telling my story and, 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 and talking about my failures and my successes. And, um, you know, one day I was invited to a conference and, and told my story on stage and there happened to be a literary uh, agent in the audience. And she told me that I needed to write this down that more people needed to hear this. So, so that's really how it came about. I had no um, idea that I would have a book uh, telling, telling my story. I always thought I would do a cookbook or something, but, um, but yeah, it, it, it morphed into this, uh, this, this, this memoir that, really explain life, you know, life is, is riddled with potholes, there's no clear path. And, you know, when you can do that, I think it empowers other people to really accept themselves and, and what they have going on. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, your book was beautifully written and very detailed. Have you always been a writer or enjoyed writing? Um, I never really... I, I, no, 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 absolutely not. Uh, in school, I, I didn't really like to write essays or things like that. Um, I, I liked writing music and poetry, but nothing like long stories like that. So this was a very um, interesting endeavor, you know, like really diving into something that you have not much experience in besides, you know, writing essays in school. So, um, so yeah, this was something that was new for me, but I was excited. I think it, it, when you're when you're new at something, it's it's a a reminder of how beautiful life is because then you can look back and see how much you progressed at, at something that um, you didn't know if you were going to succeed or fail in. Okay, so um, next question. So uh, throughout your book, it is evident that you've always been a tenacious and ambitious person. And like, it seems like you've embedded these qualities throughout your life. Um, when you big, when you booked your first gig with, uh, or like, I don't know how to pronounce this. Is it Cotier Catering or? Coterie, 
coterie catering uh-huh. coterie catering coterie catering for uh-huh. a global summit that was to be hosted the next month you had a small amount of money and no staff but in your book <laughs> you said that you like hustled to get the gig and you were gonna hustle to showcase your culinary talent for the summit mm-hmm. um where do you think you gained these qualities of like ambition and tenacity from well, I think uh, that's a great question. I think it's my mom, you know, seeing her uh, start a catering company, you know, with two kids in a, in a one bedroom apartment and hustling, not for fame, not for notoriety, just to provide. Um, for me, that, that that's the most inspiring thing. And when I look back or when I look at my current life, whenever I'm like, oh, I've got it so rough, I look back and I think of her. And if she can do those things, I know that I can, I can dig deep uh, in order to, to persevere and push through. That actually leads into my next question. Um, you know, your mother seemed, has seemed to inspire you a whole lot throughout your career. Um, has she also inspired you to write this book? She's my inspiration for everything. Um, you know, writing the book was a risk. I, I, I was very, very uh, candid, you know, with my life experiences, with my work experiences, with, you know, calling out racism in an in, in industry that... Um, you don't really talk about those things, you know, those things are swept under the rug. Um, but I knew that this would um, open up a lot of doors in my life. And, you know, my main goal has always been to take care of my mother like she's taking care of me. So she definitely is an inspiration in, in a lot of things that I do and a lot of risks that I take. Hmm. Well, that's really amazing. It is. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so in chapter eight, like when you asked your father for money to attend the Culinary Institute of America, you Mm -hmm. said like, you said what you were, you said what you were thinking when you asked your father for like this money, but you never really expressed how you were feeling. Like, Mm -hmm. how are you feeling when your father said you should become a drug dealer instead of attending the school? Like, Um, it was debilitating, you know, because I was trying to turn my life around and, um, there were so many questions like, how does he even know where to find weed? I was like, what the hell? I, like, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I didn't know that he had those types of connections. Um, but also like, you know, um, you, you look at your parents for approval um, and to be proud of you. And in that moment, I felt that he was proud for the wrong reasons um, and, and, and guiding me down a path that would have uh, led to peril, you know, and destruction. So it was it was a it was a tough pill to swallow at the time and um but you know good or bad all experience make you into the person that you are and it's not what happens to you it's how you react to what happens to you wow mm-hmm. that's very nice um in the book it said or you had said that you used to get in trouble not a whole lot sometimes um mm-hmm. if you had to go back in time would you change something from that? And if so, what would you change? I don't think I would change anything. You know, I think uh, our experiences make us who we are, good, and, good or bad. Um, and me getting into trouble was, was you know, crying out for help. You know, it was, it was me expressing myself. It was me um, playing the cards that I was dealt. It was me figuring out every single day, just like everyone else's. Um, so, so I think it was part of my journey. And it, and it makes me also have more empathy towards people because I've been through that. Um, so ask the why people are doing things instead of, um, you know, judging them uh, firsthand. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, um, well, you remember I read it and it was like really amazing, mm-hmm. but, uh, and like, it was like extremely detailed too. And I kind of wanted to know, like, how are you able to recall all these experiences from your memoir, like just the detail that you put into it. (laughs) Well, yeah, well, I have a vivid, you know, um, uh, imagination, but also a recollection. You know, I I can remember instances in my life very, very to the T, you know. Um, Also, there was a lot of research done. There was a lot of research that was not even from my perspective. I I wrote this with a co-author. And he actually like interviewed people that were in my life. Like, you know, Kwame said this happened like this. But how did you see it from the outside perspective looking in? You know, he interviewed my best friends. He interviewed my family, people I've worked with. So 
there was a lot of research that went into this book and it was a long process, it was a long arduous process. It took about, you know, over two years to write this book. So there's a lot of research and a lot of writing and rewriting that went into this. Mm -hmm. um, so within the book, um, you'd also said that you had worked for um, an oil spill, a oil spill company uh, mm -hmm. as a chef. And it was your first time taking on a lead role and being in charge. Um, have you taken those experiences for what you do today? Yeah, you know, I think you can learn from every job, how matter uh, big or small. You know, I remember my first job was McDonald's. Uh, and same, some things that I've learned there, like sweeping and mopping and organizing a walk-in refrigerator, I've taken to all, you know, all my other jobs and still to this day. And when I think about the oil spill, um, there's so many, so many things that I've taken away from that, but also the confidence of just cooking your own food and the feeling of giving someone a plate of food and seeing that instant gratification on them. On that boat, it was intense to say the least. I was cooking for like pirates that were like cleaning up this oil. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, um, they had nothing to do but eat and sleep. So, you know, I was half of their day and I was, you know, 90% of their joy because they didn't get much joy from cleaning oil. So I, um, I was able to get a, you know, uh, develop a little bit of confidence in myself that I can cook, you know, and that I can make people happy with my food. Okay. So, um, basically in your book, you said something about how, like, like during your childhood and like just throughout your life, um, people um, sometimes feared you because you were a black man, but you don't, you don't want people to fear you because of that, but you wanted to fear, like you wanted to be a force to be reckoned with because of your talent. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that although like you're this renowned chef, do you feel like people still dismiss, dismiss you as a black man and like, or is that like the first um, yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, I think, um, I think certain people will, you know, I, I, I was the other day I was driving my car and, um, I was trying to get into the sp parking space and I, um, there was a handicapped person behind me. So I was giving them a lot of time to like get into the space. And I guess we were holding up traffic and this white guy came up and knocked on my glass and told me to roll my window down and started screaming at me that I was holding up traffic. And then when I dismissed him, he said, did you steal that car? You must have stolen that car. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, people still dismiss me as a black man. I don't think racism will ever go away. Um, but you can't listen to those people because those people don't have the best interests at heart for you. And those people don't value us as people anyway. So why would I even take in that? Why would I even like receive that energy? Um, I, I try to like think less of what people think about me and think more of the actions that I do and how I perceive myself. And, you know, that's the most important to me, most important thing to me right now. Mm -hmm. um, back on the point of discrimination, you know, with in your occupation, you know, with critics and stuff, have you ever come across any like articles or any newsletters that have put you down because of your skin color or any even comments within your restaurant? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there haven't been any like, you know, headlines with a, with, with a racial, um, a racist undertone or anything like that. But there are things that I feel that they're under the guise of, of, of criticism that, that, that did uh, reflect some racist issues. And yeah, it puts me down because I think if I didn't look like the way that I looked, there would have been, um, you know, articles would have looked a little bit differently. And, you know, I'm at to the point where I don't read comments anymore, <laughs> you know, good or bad. Um, you know, I barely write, read any articles that are written about me if, I'm, if I haven't been a part of them. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it, it's something that, that will always be there. But like I said, you got to just focus on yourself and not, not be, um, so absorbent of, 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 of that kind of negativity because that will permeate throughout you. Right. Right. So the cover of your book shows you standing proudly in your chef uniform. Um, like mm -hmm. why did you choose this picture specifically or like, what was your inspiration for the cover of the book? 
think I wanted it to be identifiable. You know, I wanted, I wanted there to be a young black chef on the cover. So you knew, you know, what you were getting into and what you were reading. I think it was important to have a stoic photo on there. Um, you know, not something smiling, not something sad, but just something stern, someone, something that shows the, the seriousness of, of what you're about to open up, you know, and, and really portray, try to portray as much of the story in my face. So, you know, that's why we chose that photo. Mm. Now, there are like a ton of kids like me that I know probably who look up to you through inspiration and stuff. Um, do you have any kind of message for those kids, especially those who went through the same childhood that you'd have? I would say just believe in yourself. You know, um, no one, no, people aren't going to respect you until you respect yourself. And, you know, it doesn't matter what career path you go into. That book, you can replace the word chef with any other occupation and that narrative will remain true. Um, but all in all, just believe in yourself you know, don't really listen to the, to the critics and the naysayers, uh, listen to the ones that, that love you, people that won't kick you while you're down, people that will just lift you up and uh, surround yourself with people, you know, that believe in you more than you believe in yourself. Cause there's going to be times when you're down and you're going to need someone to, uh, to reach out to you. Uh, so I would say that's the most important thing. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> When did you like, I guess, like learn, when did you like have to learn that or like did, did not knowing that ever set you back? It's still something I strive for today. You know, I, I feel like sometimes I, I take a step backward every now and then, you know, even though I'm trying to push forward um, and I'm not perfect at all, but it, it, it's something that I strive for. I strive to continue to surround myself with like-minded people. I try to stay positive, you know, and begin the day with a mantra, like today is going to be a good day you know, to get me in the, in the mode of positivity. So it, it's a constant, it's a constant fight, you know, and it's something that I haven't mastered. So when I get there, I'll let you know. But um, <laughs> I think when you, you know, when you realize that perfection will never be attained, but you should just strive for it, uh, you have a little bit more understanding and you have a little bit more um, leniency with yourself and the mistakes that you make. Mm -hmm. Um, I have, there's one last question for me. Um, so back when you were in Nigeria with your grandfather, would you have ever thought that you'd be so successful at such a young age today and particularly be a chef? <laughs> you know, I always thought, I always knew that I was going to be successful. I didn't know what it was going to be. In. I, I used to rap when I was younger. I used to act, um, you know, I played sports um, and my goal was always to, take care of my family in any way that I could. I had no idea it was going to be in cooking. I didn't really take it as serious as a craft because I watched my mom struggle so much and she was a chef. So I thought I should go into another line of business. But when I got that passion for it, you know, when I realized I had a passion for cooking, the money did not even matter. It was really just perfecting my craft and, and getting the opportunity to do that every single day. You know, cooking is really, really fun for me, you know, and once you find that thing for you, if you have the ability to do that every single day, um, I, I think that's where true success lies. Would you call like living in Nigeria a pivotal moment in your life? Like, were you able to really receive the lessons that were taught there? And like, was it beneficial like for you being able to celebrate your culture and being around like um, different family and your grandfather? And yeah, absolutely. It was uh, it was instrumental to the the person that I am today. If you when you're stripped of your luxuries and you're placed in a pl in in a new environment, which is like a huge culture shock, and then you thrive in that, it gives you a lot of self awareness and motivation to break out of the comfort zone and continue to put yourself mm -hmm. in uncomfortable situations. And that's where the real growing happens. Um, you know, growth is uncomfortable and it doesn't happen when you're sitting, uh, you know, stagnant and sitting pretty, you know, it happens when you push yourself, when you, when you take a leap of faith, when you dive into the deep end of a pool, you know, that's where the magic happens. And that's where you start to really tread water. And that's where you get to be comfortable in life. Hmm. Mm, I lied. Actually, I do have a couple of my questions. <laughs> um, so talking you're very successful right now and 
becoming more and more popular. How are you taking the theme? Are you taking it as a triumph or more of kind of like a hindrance? You said that you don't like to read, you know, any tabloids too much Mm -hmm. or you have hindered from reading them um, or stopped reading them. Can you tell me, like, just how do you feel about the fame pretty much? (laughs) Um, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, you know, you can't let that be everything. You know, you can't think that you're bigger than you are, you know, because every single person has a story and every single person has the opportunity to be great. So I think you use it as a platform. Um, You use it as visibility. You use it to provide, you know, different opportunities for yourself and for others. Uh, So so I take it in stride. Sometimes it's it's awkward when you're like walking, taking a walk and someone asks to take a picture with you and it's like 7 a.m. Uh, but um, it's also a beautiful thing that people are um, excited for you, you know, excited to just meet you, excited to to uh, be a part of your story or hear your story, or hear more of your story, or experience your art. So it, it's a beautiful thing and it's something that I'm, I'm very, very grateful for. So um, <laughs> next question. Uh, um, so like I, I was like reading some articles and I heard that you opened a rest, like some restaurants like Kith and Kin, mm-hmm. um, Philly Bing Fry, and then the Shaw, correct me if I'm wrong, Bijou. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you said, and then you said that these, necess- these restaurants, um, closing them like were necessary for like, I guess like growing, mm-hmm. I guess, or like, growing uh for like yourself and like your and just like in business so I was kind of wondering like what did you learn from like opening and closing these restaurants that's a great question I learned something different from each restaurant you know the first restaurant uh it opened and closed really really quickly and um you know from that I learned you know uh better management skills I learned to pick your team you know because you're only as good as you know, your weakest link in your team and opening a restaurant is a commitment. You know, it's like a relationship. It, it doesn't, it doesn't just grow overnight. It grows over a period of time. Um, you know, the fast casuals, I learned how to manage numbers, you know, fast casual restaurants are all about numbers and, and managing, you know, uh, profit margins because we're, we're dealing in scalability and, um, you know, lots more cover, a lot more covers than you're used to having in, in, a, in a traditional restaurant. And then, you know, Kit and Kin was, was, a, was a big restaurant in a hotel. So, so I learned, you know, how to make a profit and, and how to manage over 100 different staff members at once. Um, so, so I learned a lot. But, you know, the, there's a saying, uh, you know, that true courage is going into each failure with the same enthusiasm. You know, and that means no matter what concept you have, no matter how crazy your idea is, even if it scares you, you go into it just excited as the last because you never know what um what the outcome is going to be for these for these different ventures um so you know you had said that you tell little bits and pieces of your story when you know talking about within your restaurant so i wanted to ask when did you say that it is time to start writing this book and sharing it with the world um, yeah, you know, some, like I said, someone approached me and said, I should write down the book and, uh, you know, it made sense. So I, it was very, very scary, you know, even writing the proposal for the book, you know, here I am putting my life on pages, talking about my family, my family issues, um, you know, my work, my work issues. So it was, it was a very daunting experience, but it was also a very cathartic experience. It was very, very therapeutic, you know, revisiting these, these, these times in your life that you sometimes don't want to talk about. But then you realize they make you who you are. You realize how far you've come. Um, so I encourage everyone to write their story down, whether you make it into a book or not. It's important to know that you have a story and you're just as special as, as anyone else. Did it like, did you like read your book? Like um, read your book and like, how did it, how did, I guess, like, how did it feel? Like, was it emotional reading it or? Did you got kind of you're like wow how far I've come? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty emotional. It's pretty emotional, and even I mean when I was writing the book, my restaurant had closed, so I didn't even have a restaurant at the time. You know, like mm-hmm. it was during that process, I was writing, I was writing the book. I opened that restaurant and it closed in the same amount of time I was writing it. So I was like, oh my god, 
this <laughs> like this, this the story was so perfect. I was gonna ride into the sunset on this restaurant. <laughs> but I remember my editor calling me and he was like, this is probably the best thing that could ever happen to this book because now this is not a Cinderella story. This is not a linear path. This shows what true life is really about. You know, there's a lot of failures, there's, there's some success, but there's usually more failure than success. Um, and, you know, this book is, is a reflection of that and is a reflection of what life actually is. Um, if you were not a chef, um, what would you think that you... What occupation would do you think you'd be in? I think if I wasn't a chef full time, I'd either be a an actor um, or uh, some sort of musician. I think I think you know the arts is something that I've always been drawn to, you know, and food is no different. You know, I, I love to express myself in different mediums and really release my creativity. So I would need to do it in some sort of some some aspect. I know I couldn't be sitting behind a desk all day. Um, or punching numbers or, or, or something like that. It would have to be something that I can artistically express myself freely. Mm -hmm. In your book, you express how cooking is like an art. And like when you're creating something, your cooking area is like a blank canvas waiting to be filled. So mm -hmm. like as a culinary artist, what do you feel or like what is going through your mind when you're cooking? Um, you know, what, what goes to my mind when I'm cooking is is that I'm just free. It's just like, uh, I'm like kind of dancing, put on a plate and I'm able to really like express myself and I can, I can convey a message, you know, I can tell a story. I always say when a story, uh, when, a, when a dish has a story, it has a soul. You're not just cooking for perfect seasoning, you're cooking to really share an experience with someone. Normally it's nostalgia, something in your childhood, something about your travels. So uh, when I'm cooking, it's just like, I can, it's fine. It feels like I'm finally free. And I can like just express myself and people can get me, you know? Um, so what would be, out of this whole book, you know, do you have like a certain quote or paragraph that resonates with you? Um, you know, there's not a certain quote or, or paragraph. I think the, just the book it's in itself, it's the, the whole narrative, you know, just really really being so open and honest and telling my story, my truth. Um, and that has led to, you know, people reaching out to me and thanking me for saying that because, you know, some people have felt like they, they've been crazy, that, that, that they, you know, are led to feel that they're crazy for thinking the things that they're thinking, whether it's at work, that they're feeling marginalized because of the color of their skin, or they've been like overlooked. Um, and this book was very validating for them uh, in, in those regards. And it, and it hasn't been hyper uh, focused just on the food industry. It's all industries. And, you know, and that's why you can change this name to notes from a young black author or notes from a young black uh, designer or notes from a young black actor. And, and, and the story will still resonate um, because there are disparities, you know, w within, you know, different cultures and, it, it, it's worth talking about. You know, we're not very far removed from segregation. We're not far removed from um, from oppression. We're still going through that. And, um, you know, this, this book really, really tells that story uh, through and through. Okay, so when, back when you're a child selling candy on the subway, or not child, but first mm -hmm. starting, um, how, tell us how you did that. Well, yeah, I was coming home from work uh, one day and it was late night. I was uh, on the subway and a kid came on and he was selling candy, you know, and the normal spiel in New York selling candy for a basketball team or to stay out of trouble. And I kind of laughed because I grew up in New York City. I always saw these kids. And then I realized, man, this kid just made like $5 in two minutes. I was like, how much is that an hour? I quickly did the math. And he's making like, you know, give or take like 60 bucks an hour. And then I it was like, how much is an eight hour shift of that? And then I did the math and I was like, whoa, this, this kid is making way more money than I am tax free. And here I am like working this job that I, that I don't really like, and I'm not really into. So I went into work the next day. I thanked them so much for the opportunity, quit my job, went to Costco, bought a ton of candy and got out in the subway and started selling. And I sold everything from, you know, Butterfingers and M&Ms to Teddy Grahams to roasted cashews. I did whatever I can get my hands on, I wanted to get off so I can start my catering company. 
And in two months, I saved up $20,000. And it was a humbling experience, you know, running into my friends in the train and, and them seeing me with this giant, like, freaking, freaking box of, of, of candy all taped together. But I knew I had a, a, a goal and I had a vision and I wasn't going to let anyone get in the way of that or stop me. Um, so then I started my catering company from that. I, I, I got my own commercial space. I got uniforms. I formulated it as an LLC. And I started doing events all around the city to the point where I was featured in the daily news. It was doing events for Matt Damon and Alfre Woodard. And, you know, I was still very young. You know, my, my catering company consisted of all my friends in high school. Uh, and we just, we just hit the streets and, and hustled. And I knew where I wanted to go. Um, and I knew I had to do something extraordinary to get there. And if you don't mind reading us a small memoir or passage from your book. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to read a story about when I cooked at the African uh, American Museum, the National Museum of African American uh, History and Culture. In, in Washington, D.C. It was a, a, a dinner honoring David Aje, and he was the architect for that building. And this was at the end of the dinner. But just before I head inside, I pause for a second to take in the enormity of the moment and my small role in it. Five stories up, and I'm still standing on hollowed ground. Caskets and chains and splintered beams of slave ships knives and forks and salt shakers, Woolworth stools and mammy figurines, freedom and blood, progress and pain, voices raised and voices silenced, courage. Now the purpose of this museum is to resurrect the dead, to honor their lives, to celebrate their progress, to remember their suffering, to never forget their stories. This building is an argument that these stories, tradition, this suffering, this history matters. In three weeks, I will open my own restaurant. And with it, I'll have a chance to add my voice to that chorus, to prove that my story, like millions of voices behind and beneath me, matters. And as I push open the kitchen door, the last of my smile fades and I get back to work. I'm standing on stories, but this one is my own. Thank you so much, Kwame and Chariot from Cinema mm -hmm. Girl for today's great conversation. Mm -hmm. You've been watching the Bay Area Book Festival. Please go to the schedule of events page to see all the great conversations coming up in this virtual festival. And don't forget to tune in for tomorrow's session with hip hop history champions, Chef Jeff Chang and Dave Davey D. Cook. Have a great day, everyone. And thank you once again, Kwame, for taking this time to speak with us. It really means a lot. Of course, thank you for having me. Appreciate it.